Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Brian. If we've never met here at Riverdale, I sure would love to meet you. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We've been going through the book of Acts since the beginning, just about the beginning of the year, and it's been a lot of fun for us, and there's all kinds of stuff we're learning in Acts. Acts is the, is the fifth book of the New Testament. Acts is the book that describes what happened in the early church. So the first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those all talk about Jesus and his, his earthly ministry for three years while he walked this earth, and he shared the good news. He established the good news. He went to the cross. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And then he appeared to his disciples and he said, hey, look, I'm out of here and you guys have to stay and you're going to plant the church. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to establish this new, what we call the Christian church. The Christian church was born. The book of Acts is the story of the birth of the Christian church. And so if you've missed the last couple of months, basically, here's what you've missed is, is these disciples were like, we don't know what, we don't, like, we're not qualified. They were a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors. They were a bunch of nobodies. They're like, are you sure you got the right people? And Jesus is like, you're going to be fine because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's God. So he gives them the Holy Spirit. This is in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. The Holy Spirit gives them power, gives them authority to share the message. The Holy Spirit gives them boldness to do this because they're going up against the establishment. They're going up against the church, uh, the church leaders. They were Jewish. Remember, so you got to remember at this point in history, 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or a Bible app. It's okay if you don't. We'll have it, the words on the screen today. But, but what, we, what we learn is that they're, they're a part of the Jewish church, they're part of the Jewish religion, but they're about ready to break off from the Jewish religion. Christianity at this point in history was, they still viewed themselves as part of like Judaism. That's, I mean, Jesus was Jewish. This whole, the whole Old Testament is Jewish scripture. It's what the Jewish, to this day, it's what Jewish believers Jewish, uh, Jewish people of the Jewish faith, it's what they read from, it's what they study from, it's their, it's their holy text, the Old Testament is. So the early Christians are saying, well, we're just Jewish now, right? Isn't everyone just gonna become Christian? It wasn't even, a, that wasn't even a word yet by them, by the way. Christian wasn't even a word. They were just followers of Jesus. They're just, that's all they were. I think sometimes we read this stuff and we think about, we think about it in terms of like church today. Even when, when I say church, you're like, oh, this is when they built buildings and, and had all this structure that we have in the American church today. That's actually not at all what was going on. I mean, they were, the early Christians at this point are still worshiping at the temple. They're meeting together at the temple. And they're, it's, I always like to say it like this, and they're having like Bible studies. That was the early church at this point. They're just having a bunch of Bible studies. It, that and their telling people about the good news of Jesus. That's it. They're having Bible studies and they're telling people about the good news of Jesus. And little did they know that they come up against opposition because the establishment, the Jewish leaders, like the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all these fancy words, these guys were working against, they rejected Jesus, they didn't believe in Jesus the way that the early Christians did. And so there's this clash. Have you noticed we've been seeing this clash We've already seen it a little bit. There's this clash between the establishment and the, and the ragtag early Christians who are still just, they're still like getting organized. Like I remember when we started Alpine, we're gonna celebrate our 23 year anniversary in two weeks. That's awesome, 23 years. Yeah, that's awesome. It was so fun to get Alpine started and, and just to think, we, we knew even back then that we were gonna be a multi-site church and just to see that we're at six campuses Six English-speaking campuses, two Spanish-speaking campuses. God's done a great thing. But in the early days, I remember, I mean, I, I moved out here from Chicago, Tracy and I did, and we got started. Um, I, I had no idea how much, like, organizational stuff you had to do. Like, we had to get a 501c3 established. We had to establish a group of elders. We had, we had to figure out we're non-denominational, meaning that we don't have a, we're not like Lutheran or Baptist or nothing against Lutheran and Baptist, but we're not a part of a denomination. So we had to like, we had to think through all these things. We were like, we should probably have a group of pastors that give some oversight to me because I'm, I was just like a, in my late 20s and just getting started, I needed leadership still. I needed some structure, and I didn't have any of that structure because we were a non-denominational church. So there's all these little things that we had to do that I never studied in seminary. 
When I went to seminary, I studied the Bible, I studied discipleship and evangelism. I didn't study like how to start a business. And this is starting a business. When you start a church, you're starting a business. There's all these things you have to do that you're like, nobody told me this. And this is why this message today is gonna be so fun for me because the question we're gonna answer today or that we're gonna ask and answer today is this. Is there a right way to organize a church? This is like a huge question that probably none of you have ever thought about. I, I won't. Some of you have probably thought about this question. In fact, some people, sometimes when people move in here from Texas or from the South, they'll come and they'll say, hey, who's in charge around here? You know? Do you have elders? Do you have pastors? Do you have deacons? All these different things. And those are, I think those are good questions because to me that shows me that they, they understand church structure, they, they understand church organization, they understand that that's necessary. And today, interestingly enough, in Acts chapter six, this topic comes up because the early church is a lot like Alpine was 23 years ago. They're experiencing growth and God's adding to their numbers and it's gonna create some necessary conversations. Conversations that they didn't necessarily wanna have to have, but they have to have because with growth, you, ha you have to have organization. If you have growth without organization, then you're probably not gonna have growth anymore at some point. I remember uh, one, of, one of the things that, some, every once in a while I'll be on a plane and, uh, and I'll be sitting next to someone and my goal is to not talk to them. I'm just gonna, I'll be honest with you. Like my goal is to not talk to them. I don't, because it could be awkward. It could, and I also, I've just learned from experience that if they ask me what I do and I'm honest and I say I'm a pastor, either we're gonna, they're gonna talk my ear off for the next three hours or it's just gonna get really, really awkward for the next three hours, you know, because they've got some church hurt or whatever. So I usually just tell them I'm a teacher, you know, I usually just lie. Um, <laughs> sorry, Did, do you not respect me now because of that? I apologize. But every once in a while, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, just the Holy Spirit will, will, will like convict me that I should open my mouth and share with boldness. So every once in a while, I'll be like, well, I'm a pastor. And, and I would say 50% of the time, I get a comment something like this, oh, I don't like organized religion. And I love, I love it when they say that because it gives me a chance to do my dad joke. I'm like, well, you should come to our church. We're not that organized. You know? <laughs> But actually, that's just a joke because we are organized. We do have pastors. We do have overseers. We call them overseers. We do have leaders in our church. Now, we don't, we don't usually use the word deacon, and I'll explain why in a second. But we have leaders in the church. We have servant leaders in the church. We have, I mean, we have so many volunteers, so many leaders in the church. Thank you, by the way, here at Riverdale, at West Haven, at Layton. Thank you for making Alpine such a great church because we have a very small staff and we have like all hands on deck. So many people serve at Alpine. We're so grateful for that. But today we're gonna answer this question because there, there's, there arises an issue in the early church where they had to think about this question. Oh no, like we can't just be about sharing the gospel with people because as people come to faith, they enter into this new community and our, this new community has to have some structure so that we can meet each other's needs, so that we love each other and meet each other's needs. And so let's look at the text and let's answer this question as we do. Acts chapter six, verse one. It says, as the believers rapidly multiply, there were rumblings of discontent. All right, I gotta pause right here. Um, just confession. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Here's why because I thought my church was the only church that had rumblings of discontent. And so when I see that the early church had rumblings of discontent, I'm like, we're not that broken. Or at least we're just as broken as the early church was broken. The truth is, to churches, you're gonna have rumblings of discontent in church. Church isn't perfect. If you're new to Alpine, you're checking out Alpine, you're considering Alpine as your home church, let me just tell you, we are not the perfect church. We're not, and the reason? It's because you're here. <laughs> Was that too mean-spirited? I'm so sorry. I, I should have said that another way. The difference is because we're all here. Like, the reason the church is imperfect is because the church is made up of imperfect people. And so if you, if you feel, if you have some church hurt, if you, if you are disappointed 
at Alpine Church, let me just cut to the chase with this statement. If you go to another church, I promise you that church will disappoint you also. I think there's different levels of disappointment. I think if they're not teaching the Bible, if they're not teaching biblical Christianity, you should go to a different church. If we ever stop doing that, you should find another church. But churches are imperfect, and even the early church was imperfect, and we see it in Acts chapter six, verse one. The believers rapidly multiplied, and whenever you have growth, you're gonna have rumblings of discontent. And they had that in the early church. And here was the specific situation in the early church. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So at this point in the early church, everyone was Jewish, with very few exceptions. There's actually one exception we'll read about today. With very few exceptions, everyone was Jewish. The message hadn't quite gotten out to the non-Jewish world. That's gonna happen in a couple more chapters. So what's happening here, though, is some of the Jewish widows were only spoke Greek, and some of the Jewish widows spoke Hebrew, and what apparently was happening is the Greek-speaking believers thought that there was favoritism toward the Hebrew-speaking believers because the widows for the Hebrew-speaking believers were, get, were given preferential treatment. So that was the situation. Now, as a pastor, my gut reaction when somebody leaves a complaint my gut reaction is like to defend ourselves or to push back. And even as I read this verse one, I'm like, I kind of feel my hackles going up a little bit. Like I want to be like, well, we're not perfect. Quit your griping. Find a team to serve on. Are you even giving yet? You know, I'm just being honest. Like these are the things that I think when I read this verse. And I want, I want you to pay attention that that is not the response of the leaders of the church in Acts chapter six, and that's awesome. I think they recognized that this was a problem and they wanted to fix the problem. I think that's awesome. Verse two, so the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. So they had like a congregational meeting. Hey, let's get all the believers together and let's try to figure this out. Here's what they said. We apostles, because at this point the 12 apostles were like the foundation of the church here, that these 12 apostles, the, the 11, and remember Judas Judas was, was no longer an apostle. Judas was dead now. And so they would replace Judas. This was all the way back earlier in, in the book of Acts. So those 12 apostles, they called together. They had this little team, this little church meeting. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Now again, when I read that, I, do you ever do this? I read it, I read into it my own biases. And I read this as like a snarky comment. Doesn't it sound snarky to you? It sounds a little snarky to me. We apostles are above this. Like, we're above this. We should be preaching the word of God, not running a lowly, stupid food program. Like, that's what I read. And you can see that I've got some of my own church hurt, apparently. But as we read on, that's actually, it should not be snark. There's no snark. They're just telling the truth here. They're like, this is our role and responsibility and really, if we, if we were bogged down by the minutia of running a food program, that wouldn't be helpful for the overall church. That's all they're saying here. So here's what they say in verse three. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected, are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. So see, look, they, they identify a problem and they say, we're gonna solve the problem with organization. We're gonna solve the problem with some structure. We need to establish this other group, this group of seven men, and we'll give them this responsibility. And then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. And so this, this is the first time in scripture that we see some administration in the early church. Now some of you guys love administration. You're wired for, you're like, this is awesome. This is the best sermon I've ever heard. I love this kind of stuff. Like, let's get down into the nitty gritty of things. And some of you are like, this is gonna be the most boring sermon I have ever heard. But for everybody, I just want you to pay attention because I wanna, I wanna explain to you how this right here is, is the reason that churches have what some churches call a deacon board. Deacons. So there are two, there are two offices 
in the church, as we read the Bible, as we read the, as we read the New Testament, there appear to be two different offices, two different like official responsibility. When I say office, I mean like the office of the president. I, I mean like an official responsibility in the church that it was so official that it has a name, it has a term. There are two of them. Only two, in the, in, as we read through the New Testament, it's only two. One is the office of pastor. And some of you say, okay, well, that's you. So you're a pastor, Bill's a pastor. So you guys know who pastors are here at Alpine Church. Well, actually, the office of pastor encompasses four different words that we find in the Bible. It encompasses the idea of pastor, the idea of elder, the idea of overseer, and even the idea of bishop. So all of these terms in the New Testament, when we read these terms, as you study, we don't have time to get into the details, but as we study this, like all of those terms are clearly lumped into one category. Now I know that's confusing for some of you at Alpine because you're like, wait a second, but we have what we call overseers. Every campus has an overseer team. Now some churches call those elders, but we, we don't in Utah because elder is already taken. So... <laughs> Like, that, I mean, no offense, but that, like when, like, when I think of the word elder, I think of a 19-year-old, you know, boy. So we're like, that's the, that's the word in the Bible, but another word for that in the Bible is overseer. And so years ago, we said, let's use the word overseer. That would be less confusing. So we use the word overseer. Every campus at Alpine has an overseer team. So here at this campus, we have an overseer team in Riverdale. Leighton Campus, I just met with the overseer team. Yesterday, we had a great meeting praying for the church. West Haven campus, a week ago, I met with the West, Pastor Jared and I met with the West Haven overseer team. Every campus has an overseer team. And essentially, I want you to hear this, essentially, they're part of the pastoral team. Biblically, there's, no, there's not a different concept. There's not a distinction between pastor and overseer and elder. In fact, you're gonna hear us refer to the pastoral team more often now here at Alpine. And when we refer to that, we're talking both staff pastors and what some churches would call lay pastors, or in our case, we call them overseers. We consider all of those men as part of the pastoral team. And their job is to, is to give spiritual oversight to each campus, to pray for the campus, to love the campus, to connect with the campus. And I love that we have that at Alpine Church. That is one of the two offices. Okay? The other office that we see in the Bible, there's only, so there's, everyone tracking with me? There's pastor slash overseer slash elder slash bishop. The other office is the office of deacon. And this passage right here is the first example of what many people would believe is like the establishment of a deacon board. Now this is happening, by the way, let me give you some dates. This is happening between 30 and 36 AD. This is the early church. So this is before 36 AD, okay? So this is early on in the church. But here's the thing. The word diakonos, which is the Greek word for deacon, is not used here. So even though people, when people look at this idea, they're like, oh, I see what this is. This is the, earth, this is the elder team the overseer team, the pastoral team, this is the pastoral team establishing a deacon board. That's what's happening here. And if you think that that's what's happening here, then you're actually reading into it a little bit. You're reading into your experience, your church experience. You're reading it backwards into the text, which is really easy to do. That's not actually what's happening. They don't, they don't come up with the word diakonos. In fact, the word diakonos doesn't even show up until after 50 AD, not for another 20 or 30 years that the word actually shows up and it's formalized and I'll show you those texts in just a little bit. My point for all of this is just to say the reason we're asking this question today is because what's happening here in this text is the early church is saying, they're not officially forming a deacon board, what they're doing is they're saying, we need structure. We need structure, even though they didn't have language for it yet. They're saying we need structure. And today I wanna show you, I wanna show you where the rest of the New Testament explains when they started bringing the language into it. And then I'm gonna finish today by applying it to our church with a few kind of summary points. So let's get going, because we've got a lot to cover. Let's read on. Acts chapter six, verses five and six. 
It says, everyone like this idea. That might be the biggest miracle in the Bible right there. <laughs> is that, is that a, a church leader had an idea and everybody said, amen. Like, wow, everybody liked this idea. I don't know if that's ever happened at Alpine Church in 23 years, that we had an idea and everyone liked it. I mean, seriously, like, this is a miracle from God. I should just move on. This, this, is, this means more to me than it does to you, apparently. Let's just move on. So here's who they chose. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. They chose Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Hakuna Matata, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. By my count, this is the first guy mentioned in the Bible, in the Christian church, who's not Jewish. This is the first guy, this is the, everyone else is Jewish. I just made this big deal about everyone being Jewish, but this guy wasn't, Nicholas. He came to the Jewish faith, and then when he heard about Jesus, he came to Christianity. And so this is the first guy, like the first of many, by the way. It says, verse six, these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them, and they laid their hands on them. So a couple things, notice that they went to the congregation, the congregation all affirmed it, but they were appointed. Here at Alpine Church, we appoint leaders, we appoint overseers, we appoint leaders in the church, we don't vote on it. We don't have a vote. By the way, some of this is, when you study this, this kind of stuff in the Bible, you have to decide, is this being descriptive or is this being prescriptive? In other words, is this describing the way it was in the early church or is this prescribing the way it should be forever? Can I say that again? When we're reading the book of Acts, we have, one of the things we have to figure out is, is this describing the way it was and that's it? Or is this prescribing the way it should be? Acts chapter six doesn't give us the answer. The rest of the Bible gives us the answer. The rest of the New Testament gives us the answer, and that's why we need to look to the rest of the, of the New Testament. Here we go, you ready? Put your thinking caps on, because we're gonna go really quick. The word diakonos, that's a Greek word that for us, it's most little translation is deacon. The word diakonos shows up in Paul's writings 21 times. 21 times the word diakonos shows up. We're gonna do a little quick little Bible study here between our three campuses, quick little Bible study. The word diakonos shows up 21 times and only three of those 21 times is he referring to the office of deacon in the church. The rest of the time, he's referring to just what, what diakonos means in general terms, it just means servant. In fact, depending on the translation you use, Diakonos is either translated deacon, servant, or minister, one of those three words. But if you were to read it in Greek, it would all 21 times, it would just say diakonos. But the way our translations work is the translators get together and they say, what is the best sense of this word? What does this word really mean? And we're gonna either use minister, deacon, or servant. And I'm gonna share a few examples just so you understand what I'm talking about here. I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share a few examples where the word diakonos in Greek was actually just a general term for a servant. One example is Romans 15, eight, where it says Christ has become a servant. In Greek, Romans 15, eight says Christ has become a diakonos. Was Jesus a deacon in a local church? Was, G was Jesus on a deacon board? No. Diakonos is a general term for servant, okay? That was one example. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 3, verse five. Apollos and Paul are both called diakonos. Now in the NLT, it's, the translation is servant. But again, if you're reading it in Greek, it would say diakonos, deacon. Wait, Paul and Apollos were deacons? No, they weren't deacons in a local church. Deacons in a local church stayed there in the local church. So that's another example. Here's, a, here's another one. Colossians 1, 7, and, four, and Colossians 4, 7. Two guys, Epaphras and Tychicus. They were both referred to as diakonos, but again, if you read the context in Colossians, it's clear that they're, they're not deacons in the local church. They're, they're called ministers. In the NLT, it says ministers. They're ministers, more like regional ministers. They're not deacons in a local church. And one more example. This is the most alarming example. 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. It says that Satan has deacons. Did you know Satan had deacons? Well, it doesn't say that in your Bible translation. 
The word in Greek is diakonos. Satan has diakonos. But in your Bible translation, in the NLT, it says Satan has servants. The servants of Satan. The deacons of Satan. I actually like deacons better. Deacons of Satan, you know. Satan has his organization as well. And he has servants as well. But obviously, the word diakonos, those are not like local deacons in a local church. So those are just some examples of the uh, 18 times that the word diakonos shows up where it's not referring to the office of deacon in the early church. Only three times does it actually refer to the office of deacon. Let me tell you where they are. Here it is. Number one, Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul says this, I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. See that? Including the church leaders, that's the word for elder, pastor, overseer, and deacons, and so what Paul is doing in Philippians 1.1, which was written around 60 AD, so in Philippians 1.1, Paul is articulating a difference in the church in Philippi. He's articulating a difference between the elders or pastors and the deacons. That was the first one. Here's the next one, 1 Timothy 3, starting in verse 8. Paul's writing to Timothy, one of the leaders in the church, and he says, in the same way, deacons must be well-respected and have integrity. Now, 1 Timothy was written shortly after Philippians. So in Philippians, he talks about it, and then in 1 Timothy, he talks about it again, and this time, we don't have time for it, but I encourage you to read 1 Timothy 3. He, that whole chapter, actually, the first part of the chapter talks about qualifications of elders or pastors, and the second part of the chapter talks about qualifications of deacons. So that's the second time. So clearly, by 60 AD, in Paul's mind, this is an actual thing in the church. In Paul's mind now, there's actually a distinction. But you see, that's 30 years after the book of, what we're reading in the book of Acts. So it takes some time, and I know this from experience, it takes some time to put some language to your organization. So what happened in the early church with Stephen in Acts chapter 6 is they, they say, we need this role, but 30, year, 30 years later, Paul has a name for the role. And he calls it deacon. And here's the last example. Romans 6 one and two, Paul says this to the churches in Rome. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church of Centria. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. So the third time, it's actually the first time, because Romans was written around 57 or 58 A.D., so this is actually the, Romans chapter 16, verse 1, referring to a woman, by the way, is the first time in Paul's writings where he's mentioning the office of deacon in the church, and it's a woman. Now, some of you maybe have a little bit of a visceral reaction to that, and I'm going to talk about that for just a couple minutes. Because here's, here's what this all boils down to. Can I just give you the summary points? Because we're almost out of time. Here's what, here's what I think we can say for sure from the Bible. I know this has been, for some of you, you're like, I love this kind of sermon. We're really getting to the nitty gritty. Some of you are like, we've talked about Greek way too much today for me. Okay. But I want to kind of, I want to summarize it with a few points here. Number one, the office of overseer or elder or pastor is different from the office of deacon, which is another word for minister or servant. It's just different. There's a difference between those two offices. Number two. We've already made that clear. The office of overseer was open to men only. The office of deacon appeared to be open to both men and women. I want to talk about how we do here at Alpine Church. And I know some people get fired up about this depending on where you stand on this, but I just gonna, I'm just going to be really honest with you. I want to tell you how we view this at Alpine Church. We, we view spiritual authority as a very important thing in the church. And we believe that the office of overseer or pastor or elder is an, is, an, is an office that, according to the Bible, we believe that it's prescribed in Scripture that this is how it should be that in God's church that, that people who fill that office should be men. And I know in our culture, like if you're, if you're walking in here off the streets and like this is the first sermon you've ever heard, you'd be like, what are you talking about? That is... Like, that was, that's so old-fashioned. What I'm talking about is what God's order is, what God's, what God's prescription is for the church. 
Men and women are different. Men and women are different. Our culture is blurring the lines between men and women. Men and women are different. At Alpine Church, we, more than culture, more than the world, we want to be obedient to God's word and what it says. We've studied this as a pastoral team, as an executive team. We've prayed about this. I'm totally open, totally open to having women pastors if that's what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. I'm just telling you, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible makes it clear that this role should be reserved for men. Godly servants who love the church and are willing to give up their lives for the church. It's the same principle as leadership in the home. We believe that in the home, men should be spiritual leaders. Men should be spiritual. That doesn't mean that women can't be leaders. I wanna make sure you hear this because that's the second part of this point, right? Women can be leaders at Alpine Church. Women are leaders. They are very important leaders. My wife, Tracy, has a very important role in the church. Whitney at the Layton campus. Melissa at the, at the West Haven campus. Tracy at this campus right now, they play this role. We call it the Connections Admin. That role is incredibly important, but we are very careful as a church not to put on their list anything that we feel like is a pastoral burden. We wanna protect women from a pastoral burden because that's what we read in scripture. Scripture makes this very clear. So we do it out of protection, out of love for the women in our church, and we do it because God says to do it. That's why we do it. Again, I understand some of you might be like, I don't know if I believe in that, I, I don't know if I'm convinced. Here's all I would ask you if that's you, is okay, you bring me the scripture that tells me differently, because I'm not. we're not gonna talk about your feelings and my feelings. We're just not gonna do that. This is not something where our feelings get to rule. This is something where we say, I wanna know what God's word says. God's word prescribes this. It doesn't just describe it, it prescribes it. And that's why we do this here at Alpine Church. Again, women in our church have very important roles. This is not to denigrate or demean women at all. But this is what God's word says. And here's, I think, the result of it. The result of this is we have godly men in our church who step up and carry the pastoral burden at our campuses, and this is how it should be. And it means that we have godly men in our homes who step up and love their wives like Christ loved the church. Jesus died for the church. That's what spiritual leadership is about. Spiritual leadership isn't about asserting your authority and, and holding, it, holding it over women. Spiritual leadership is about being willing to die for your wife and your kids. And it's, I feel like it's a, it's a trick of the enemy to blur the lines between men and women so that men are taking a back seat. And that's not how it's gonna be at this church because that's not how it was in the early church. So that's what we believe. Now, if I didn't offend you with that, I might offend you with the next thing. However, the second part of this, this is like, this is a sermon that can offend everybody. Here we go. The office of deacon appeared to be open to both men and women. This is actually why we don't use the term deacon at Alpine. Because in some churches, there's, there's not clarity about what deacon means and what it doesn't mean. We, we tend to just talk about leaders at Alpine, leadership teams and team leaders and things like that. It is clear from scripture that Phoebe was a deacon. So clearly, women could be deacons in the sense of being a leader in the church. But yet, it's very clear as we study, and we, again, we're not studying all this, but as we study the, the elder slash pastor slash overseer term, it's very clear that they have the spiritual authority that's only for men. So our best understanding of this is the deacon role if we were to use that term, doesn't carry the spiritual authority that the overseer, elder, pastor role carries. But because that's really confusing to people who are coming from other parts of the country who have different understandings of deacons, we try, that's why we try to avoid that term because you might think it means something it doesn't mean to us. So we tend to call those, those people servant leaders in the church or leaders in the church and we have men and women who lead in the church in that role, and thank God for all of you who do that. That's all I have to say about that. Number three, the appointment to either of these offices was a serious thing, and both overseers and deacons were expected to be wholehearted followers of Jesus. We're gonna learn next week, if you come next week, 
we're gonna learn that Stephen, let's go ahead and call him a deacon. Stephen, a deacon, is gonna become the first martyr in the Christian church. It's not like, it's not like Paul, or it's, Paul wasn't a Christian. It's not like Peter and James and John were like, all right, look, the elders and deacons, or the elders and overseers and pastors have this high bar to hit, but the deacons have this low bar to hit. Like, if they're not pursuers of God, it's fine. You can just be a deacon. No, they all, I mean, read 1 Timothy 3. They all, there was this high bar for everybody. Everybody was pursuing God. Everybody took their faith seriously. Everybody was filled with the Spirit. In fact, 1 Timothy 3, 9, Paul says this. They must, de about deacons, they must be committed to the mystery of the faith, now revealed, and must live with a clear conscience. He's talking about deacons. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith and, and must live with a clear conscience. Paul, by the way, the guy who wrote this right here, Paul, the first time we're gonna meet Paul is gonna be next week because Paul was on the wrong side. He was on the wrong team at this time in Acts chapter seven. Paul was there overseeing the first martyr in the Christian church and it was Stephen. And I wonder, I wonder if when Paul wrote this later on as a Christian now, when he writes these instructions about deacons to Timothy, I wonder if he didn't have Stephen in mind. Because he saw, he was a witness to Stephen, a deacon. He was a witness to him, and you'll see it next week, like he preaches this amazing spirit-filled sermon to these spiritual leaders. Paul's among them, and they stone him. They, it, was a, it was the first Christian that got to get stoned. Not, not in today's terms, but like the first Christian to get, no, okay. Maybe we'll try that next week. Maybe you'll be more ready for that next week. But Paul got to see that. He got to see the faith of he got to see the faith of Stephen before he was even a Christian. And so every leader in the church, whether you're a, just a servant leader on a clean team or vacuuming in here or serving our kids in kids' church or our students or up here on the worship team, every leader in our church, like we want everyone to have just this, this heart for Jesus and, and a relationship with Jesus. We want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want you to be a pursuer of God. That's what they were in the early church. And one more thing, last thing. However it's organized, the church should protect and proclaim the gospel. That's kind of the point. We, we should proclaim the gospel. We've seen this already in the early church in the book of Acts. They're proclaiming the gospel. They're proclaiming the gospel. But later on in Acts, we're gonna see that the leadership of the church has to protect the gospel. And to this day, 2,000 years later, we have to protect the gospel. Because the gospel, the churches, have you noticed this? Churches are being infiltrated with non-Christian beliefs. That's why leadership in the church matters. Because we need to protect the gospel for the next generation. One of the things we're trying to do right now at all of our campuses is we're trying to grow our overseer team, our pastoral team. We're trying to grow it, and we're trying to grow it with younger people. At the moment, we've got a lot of 50 and 60-year-olds on our pastoral teams, which I love it. I think that's awesome. Thank you. For our, for our men who are serving so faithfully. But we look around the table. Yesterday with, in late, at our Leighton campus, I looked around the table. No offense, guys, but we were all old, and if we had hair, it was gray hair. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the overseers in Leighton and the overseers in, in West Haven and the overseers here at Riverdale, we all agree, like, like we need to get some younger men around the table. I was in my late 20s when I started Alpine. We need to have some overseers in their late 20s. We need to have some overseers in their 30s, in their 40s, because we need, to, we need to get around the table, take our job seriously, proclaim and protect the gospel for the next generation. We're celebrating 23 years at Alpine. And in 23 more years, we wanna have a healthier church than we've had even today. And, that's, and when we do that, here's what happens. Last verse, Acts 6, verse 7. So God's message continued to spread. I love that. Like, after this boring sermon, the end of it was, God's message continued to spread. I mean, the beginning of it, there's like complaining and dissension and grumbling, but seven verses later, God's message continues, why? Because, because they addressed the issues, they, they prayerfully considered what should we do, they reorganized, they reorganized, they said let's create this thing here and, and then the result of it is God's message continued to spread. They continued to proclaim the gospel 
And the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem. And many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Isn't that cool? Even the Jewish priests were converted because the church was organized. And the church moved forward and everybody got involved. And that's the point. That's why it's important for us to ask these questions and answer these questions. We need to be organized enough. I don't like organized religion either. But we need to be organized enough to move forward with health, to make sure the needs of our church are met, to make sure the gospel is being protected and to make sure that the gospel is being proclaimed to every generation. This is what the early church did. This is what we intend to do. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can read this story of this church from 2,000 years ago. That's crazy, 2,000 years ago. And then to look at our church today and to say, okay, we're the same church. God, may we be the same church. May we, may we be asking these questions and answering these questions for your glory so that your message, your gospel can be proclaimed and protected. And God, I pray that many, many more people would come to know who you are because of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.